Our scripture this morning is found in the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sight. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You feel naked if you don't have your watch on. Fear and faith cannot occupy the same space in your hearts or in your mind. Fear and faith cannot occupy the same space in your hearts and in your mind. Fear is an emotion. Faith is a choice to believe God's word. Faith is why three precious souls joined God's church today. Fear is why the disciples' faith faltered. Jesus had previously given them counsel concerning fear. He told them, arise and do not be afraid. They chose to ignore that counsel. But from their experience, we can learn two truths that we need to remember when our faith falters. If you haven't been there, it's coming. I've told you this story before. In my Air Force career, I had finally arrived. I was the squadron commander. That's a big deal in the military. 1% of officers are asked to be a unit commander. I was there. I had arrived. I could barely get my head through the door. <laughs> and there was a 5 kilometer or 10 kilometer race in Fort Walton Beach. And back then I was in better shape and I could run. So I asked my administrative sergeant if he wanted to run the race. He said, sure. I said, okay, go sign us up. It was Saturday morning. We got to the starting line. And the staff sergeant said, sir? You always got to start sentences with, sir. I thought you were a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, I am. He said, isn't that your church right across the parking lot? And it was. He says, what are you doing here? All of us. Thank you have our faith falter from time to time. So when we experience that, we need to remember the lessons that we learned from John chapter 20. Through the locked doors, Jesus suddenly materializes. He's in the midst of his disciples, those who are fearful and not faithful. By looking at the scripture reading, we can discover that Jesus 
can transform us even when our faith falters. So you should be in John chapter 20, somewhere around verse 19. How does Jesus transfer those who faith has faltered? First, he transforms us with his peace. Notice the first words Jesus speaks after materializing. He says to his disciples, peace be with you. Now put yourself in Jesus' place for a moment. In your mind, relive what has transpired in the past 10 days. Relive how many times the disciples have faltered. How many times they had let him down. How many times they had made the wrong choice. How many times they didn't believe. And yet his first words are not the words I'd have picked. I'd have said something about their silliness and their stupidity and their lack of faith. But Jesus, in his compassion and his mercy, he says, peace, he's positive, he's upbeat, he's encouraging. When our hearts are fully converted to Jesus, but we then fail him, as I think the disciples did, we need to hear those words too. That was a long race I ran that day. I wanted to slap Jack just silly. Now I did in my mind as I was running those six miles. But at the end, race started at 10, worship starts at 11, I run slowly. There were people at the church when I was finished running. Many of them were military people. Most of them understand the role a commander has. Harold, head elder, sees me and says, I was a colonel, he was a chief master sergeant. He says, hey, colonel, look forward to seeing you next Sabbath. And went home. I mean, I had all my defenses and rationalization built up. I was ready. But he said, peace be with you. It's okay, we'll see you next week. When our hearts are converted and we fail, we need to remember Jesus offers us his peace. Amen. Jesus could have rebuked, but he didn't. He takes the long view. He doesn't have egos to defend. He doesn't have emotions that need to be satisfied. He knows that we're in this battle for a while, and the adversary is pretty sly and powerful. Jesus wants us to have peace which passes all understanding. Why would he want us to have peace? John chapter 14. Look with me at verse 27. Jesus says in verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Not, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, Jesus understands that fear and faith can't occupy the same place in your heart and your mind. And he doesn't want fear to be there. So he wants his peace to be there. When our faith falters, we need to remember that Jesus loves us anyway. The second way he transforms us is with his purpose. 
In Luke 24, 27, it says the disciples were startled. They were frightened when he materialized in their midst. They think he's a ghost. As if there wasn't enough to be afraid of in their minds. Now we got this apparition showing up in our midst. They know our secret hiding spot. Jesus shows them his wounds to convince them it's really him. Then Jesus does something interesting. Look in John chapter 20, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. This is the group of disciples who have failed him multi times in the last fortnight. He doesn't rebuke them, he offers them his peace, and then he gives them an assignment. I don't care what's happened in the past, here's what I want you to do tomorrow. Verse sums up the purpose for all of God's children. Us, when we falter in our faith. When our faith falters, Jesus wants us to continue to be his ambassadors. There isn't a backup plan. If we fail to be his ambassadors... There isn't a backup plan. Jesus transforms us when our faith falters with his peace, with his purpose, and thirdly, with his power. Before the disciples go out to share the good news back then and today, we need supernatural power and God's spiritual gifts. If you try to do what God asks in your strength, it'll be fun to watch. Good entertainment, just not very successful. Look at John chapter 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. That would be an interesting to see. And said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This was a foretaste, a sample, if you will, of the Holy Spirit who'd come in fullness on the day of Pentecost a little bit further in the future. On the day of Pentecost, they would receive the spiritual gifts and the power they needed to do the purpose for which God sent them. When your faith falters, you need to remember that Jesus never commissions you to do anything without empowering you to do it. More than once, as I have worked with saints... I suggest they do something. Their response is, I can't do that. My response is, you're absolutely right, but Jesus can. Amen. Either we are fearful or we are faithful. When we think we can't, we need to remember Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 13. Pastor, I can't. I know you can't. Philippians 2, 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. It ain't you doing it in the first place. For his good pleasure. You can study that. It's kind of an interesting term. It means God wants to use you to bless others. That's his good pleasure. Either you let him. Don't steal my lines. If I set it up, I get the punchline, okay? Man. Either we are fearful or we are faithful. God wants to use us to bless others. Flip over to chapter 4, verse 13. 
Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We are either faithful or we give in to fear. Either we claim the promise of God's word or we listen to the enemy. One or the other. Fourth way that Jesus transforms us is through his proclamation. John 20, verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Let's think critically about that verse for a moment. Jesus does not... Just want to make sure you got that right. Mean that the disciples can forgive sin. That's not what the verse means. Not a single instance recorded in scripture of the disciples absolving anyone of sin. It's not in the book. So if Jesus meant the disciples could forgive sins, don't you think it would have been recorded somewhere? That's not what Jesus means. Only God can forgive sin. Jesus is giving his disciples and by extension us... The privilege of sharing the good news with sinners. The mechanism that they must use to obtain God's forgiveness. When a person believes and confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we have the privilege of proclaiming that God has forgiven them of their sins. We don't provide the forgiveness. We just kind of help them celebrate. We help ring the bell. We help to praise God for what God has done. Amen. Find 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 20. It says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You and I are the ambassadors. We proclaim the good news. So when our faith falters, and you all have your own story of running a 10 kilometer race when you shouldn't have been. When our faith falters, remember Jesus transforms us from that faltering person through his peace, his purpose, his power, and his proclamation. Now that would be a good enough sermon in and of itself, but i got at least another 15 minutes, so I have another main point. Some of you are paying attention. Susan's shaking her head like, why? Not only does he take us from the slime pit we've uh, given ourselves permission to swim in and pull us back up, clean us off, and put us on the side of the slime pit and say, okay, you're better now, let's continue on. But he understands our doubts. When Jesus appeared to his disciples, Thomas wasn't there. Disciples, after the experience, go look for Thomas, find him, and tell him the good news. They had seen the risen Savior. John 20, verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print, I'm sorry, and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. For Thomas, the idea of seeing is believing apparently didn't work. He had to touch Jesus. 
He had to put his fingers in places. I'm not sure I'd want to put my fingers. Thomas is so discouraged by what has happened that he chooses not to believe Jesus. He chooses not to believe the reports of the guys he's lived with for the last three years. For us, when our faith falters, it's comforting to know that Jesus understands our doubts. For example, consider John the Baptist. He was put in prison by King Herod. John the Baptist had baptized, that makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus. John heard God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John is the only person in the Bible to call Jesus the Lamb of God. You would think he had gotten it all together. And yet, as he sits in the prison cell, he becomes discouraged and his faith falters. If it happens to John, there's really no surprise that it happens to mere mortals like me. So what does he do while he's there in prison with his mind and heart filled with fear? Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. And when John the Baptist had had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and they said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Notice the insight that Jesus displays in his answer. Verse 4. Jesus answered and said, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Jesus doesn't give him a theological explanation of why he's who he is. He just says, look around, see what's going on. The things he lists in verse 4 through 6 are things that only the Messiah could do. When John's disciples leave to report back to John who's in prison... Jesus is aware of what's going on in his his environment. In the military, we call that situational awareness. What's going on around you? Because he knows the crowd has heard the disciples ask the question. And he knows that the crowd holds John in high regard. Notice what Jesus says about John, verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. This is the guy who is not even sure you're the Messiah. And yet Jesus understands that in prison, doubts can enter in. Jesus personally knows doubts can enter in. If there is another way, please take this cup from me. On an emotional level, Jesus understands that sometimes faith can falter. That's why he doesn't condemn. That's why he transforms those of us who have stumbled and helps us grow. The following Sunday, eight days after Thomas requires physical proof, the disciples are meeting again. I'm in John 20, verse 26. 
John 20, 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the door being shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace to you. He materializes again. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your finger here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Jesus knows fear and faith can't coexist. You either have one or you take the other. He doesn't want Thomas to be doubting. No record in scripture of the disciples seeing Jesus between this and the previous interaction. No record in scripture that anyone told Jesus what Thomas had said. Therefore, Thomas instantly realizes Jesus is who he says he is, has supernatural power and knowledge. Amen. Thomas is overwhelmed. Look at verse 28. Thomas answers and says to him, my Lord and my God. This statement comes from so-called doubting Thomas. His confession surpasses any other confession made by a disciple. Thomas is the last to believe in the resurrection, but he's first to fully grasp its significance. Jesus is not only his Lord, but he's also God. After his recent behavior, Jesus again doesn't rebuke Thomas. Verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Those who haven't seen but yet believe are us. Sometimes it's not easy to believe. All your senses tell you something else? That irrational fear that we all have in our head tells us, don't do that. Are you silly? And yet the book says, go. Do. No, not me. No, no. I don't think that applies to me. Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas for his doubts. Verse 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The word blessed in this verse means... A satisfied faith. A satisfied faith doesn't require visions, doesn't require miracles, doesn't require prosperity, or seeing someone return from the dead. A faith which doesn't require these things, but is simply based on the word of God, is far superior to the faith that comes from sticking your finger into the hole in Jesus' hand. Either this book is true or it isn't. It's not partially true. It's not partially relevant. Either we base our lives on the book or we don't. Faith which doesn't require all those physical things based on the word of God is far superior. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again. Land with me in verse 7. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. For we 
should walk by faith, not by sight. I ad lib there a little bit, but you get the idea. You and I have all the proof we need. The question is, do we believe it? Because sometimes it's not logical. Sometimes you don't get to the same conclusion using your far superior intellect. Turn over to Romans chapter 10. Okay, get ready there, Mika. We're about ready to come to you in a minute, though. Just wanted to make sure you're awake. Romans chapter 10, look with me at verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you want faith instead of fear, you better be spending time in the Word of God. That's where the faith comes from. Okay, Mika. Christ Object Lesson, page 100. The print is small. Sorry, it was a long quote. The Scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of character. You want to be a better person? Read the Bible. Christ prayed, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. If, I hate that two letter word. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attitude. The Holy Spirit comes to convict sin and the faith that springs up in the heart works by love to Christ Conforming us in body, soul, and spirit to his own image. Then God can use us to do his will. Not before. The power given us works from within outwardly. Leading us to communicate to others the truth that has been communicated to us. If we want to be about the business that Jesus wants his ambassadors to be about, you better be spending time in this book. If not, there won't be faith. There will be fear. A means of developing a transforming and enduring faith. There's no substitute for time in God's word. Lift your toes up because I'm going to step on them. She thinks I'm kidding. 120 people average attendance on a worship day. That's pretty good. That's about the maximum seating capacity of this room. You know what the average attendance is for our midweek Bible study? Hundred and twenty of you here today. And even if the hurricane wasn't coming Tuesday, you know how many I'd see on Tuesday night? About seven. Hold that thought. And let me add this reminder. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that only about 5% of the church will be ready to see Jesus when he comes. I'm not a great mathematician. But if I divide 7 by 120, I bet I get close to 5%. Okay, you can put your feet down. I'm done. John writes that Jesus did many other signs. Miracles, we would call them. Not recorded in the gospel. If you take all of the four gospels together, there are 35 different miracles recorded for us. John only shares seven of them. John chapter 20, verse 31, tells us why. But these are written, in other words, his gospel, 
that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John's purpose wasn't an academic pursuit. It wasn't a historical summary of the life of Jesus. It was a spiritual effort so that his readers would have eternal life by believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Every one of us will experience an opportunity to have our faith falter. Some of us who are slow learners have more than one opportunity. Sometimes I wish I learned things quicker. When our faith falters, you need to remember John chapter 20. Because it exemplifies, clarifies, illustrates what's told to us in James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's standing and waiting. He's been there, done that. He even got the t-shirt. But he waits on us. To take the initiative. And when we draw near to him, John chapter 20 tells us how he's going to transform us and why he's going to transform us because he understands our doubts. When you falter in your faith, and if you haven't yet, you will. I'm not a prophet, I just know. Your choice is, God, I am sorry, please forgive me. Or you will cave and let Satan beat you up for the rest of your life. If you ask forgiveness in accordance with 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our faith that faltered. If you don't draw near to God, Satan has won. The choice is ours. And I have no idea what the closing song is, but I bet Susan does. And it's in your bulletin, so I'll look it up when I move over here. What is it? 304. 304. stand for our closing hymn, hymn number 304.
a seat for a moment. Uh, Alan, make your way up here and join these two young ladies on the platform. Take your time. I mean, these people want to go home, so just it's not important. Cool air. Oh, this is nice. Good afternoon, Auburn. Oh, nice. Good afternoon, Auburn. Good afternoon. On behalf of Auburn Church Family and Prime Minister's Department, we welcome you into the church. Amen. So we have a small token, and this is for Alan. I have to hug, I can shake. God bless you. Thank you. And let's see, who is Alex? Let's let me check it out. <laughs> this is Alex. God bless you, and I'm going to give you a hug also. Welcome. And this is Laurel. Lauren. Lauren. Yes. Hmm. Okay. God bless you. Welcome. This is Lauren. When she's 55, she'll remember the pastor that gave her an identity crisis. <laughs> Those three are going to be right down here as soon as the prayer is over, and I'd ask you all to come and welcome them as your new brother and sisters. Let's pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for understanding that sometimes our faith falters. Thank you, Lord, that you understand we don't live in an easy world because you lived here before us. Amen. You know the adversary. And the good news is you won against the adversary. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you through the application of the word by the Holy Spirit in our lives. We too can have victory through your righteousness. Motivate us, Lord, to grow into the children you have called us to be for your glory. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 